On one occasion, I decided to change my hairstyle. So during the wash period, when we were issued razor blades, my brother removed the safety edge from the government issue Gillette safety razor and was able to shave my head. It was much easier to wash in the mornings with no hair and much faster. However, I had gone against the prison rules and was put on a governor's report and put in solitary confinement for a period of time. At the meal time, it caused an amusing stir and I was to get laughed at when one of the cooks slapped a handful of strawberry jam on my head. After this, when my hair grew a little, I was able to raise a parting in my hair, which was really the beginning of the hair fashions for the skinhead. I could not help but notice the various characters, and the first points of conversation were, what a sentence have you got, and what were your crimes? After this, an inquiry would be made as to your present convictions and prison sentencing. After a month in Canterbury Prison, I was shipped off to Wormwood Scrubs in London, which was a borsal allocation centre. After a period of four weeks, it was decided I was to go to Dover Borstal, a closed borstal called the Citadel. For the first time, I was on my own and was removed from one cell to another, having to share time with others. I didn't really enjoy this here, as I was lonely and being on my own. We were allowed to go to church on a Sunday, which I did to break the monotony. However, I remember when I was in Wormwood Scrubs, I was horrified by the fact that I saw one inmate tear a page out of the Bible to roll a cigarette. This was probably the first sense of me acknowledging an existence or fear of God. Whilst in the Scrubs, I heard news of my brother from an inmate who came from Canterbury Prison. I was told... Michael had taken his revenge on one of the screws called Titmouse. It was a screw that had been unsympathetic to our mum when she travelled all that way from Kent Quarter Sessions Court to Canterbury Prison to see us that rainy night. He showed no concern for our mum. This screw was over six feet tall and intimidated inmates. Well, Michael was not prepared to put up with him any more and one day he head-butted him and knocked him out. Of course, he was in solitary confinement and dealt with by the system. This was the kind of news that travelled quickly via the grapevine from prison to prison. When in Dover Borstal, I was placed in an open dormitory with five other lads, where I had to learn to survive. There was a six-foot-six lad named Tio, who was bullied mercilessly by a five-foot-six spectacled bottle job called Vince Bowker. I saw this bullying the moment I arrived, and Tio was made to do this, to do that, and he would say, yes, Vince, no, Vince, and so on, hoping to get off lightly and have an easy life. This went on for weeks, and I felt sorry for Tio. In the end, Tio turned and lashed out at Vince Barker in anger, and that put a stop to that kind of bullying. I was determined I was not going to let anyone bully me. I stood my own ground, whenever I sensed anyone trying to bully me. I was, in fact, nicknamed Flash Clark because I acted as though I owned the place and I had all kinds of goods like cocoa, coffee, milk, sugar and even Ovaltine and had one of the senior green tie bottle inmates who was ready for release to make me Ovaltine in the morning. Of course, he had his share fair share too, which was his reward. Scum, this is a film made about life in Borstal featuring Ray Winston. This is a real, true-to-life story of what it was like in Borstal. On another occasion, a six-foot bully was moved into our dormitory because he had mercilessly bullied another inmate who in fact was a married man. He had asked for solitary confinement to get away from being bullied, so the screws decided to put this lad in with me in the dormitory. We got on well until I one morning decided to have a joke on him. I tied his bootlaces together for a joke, but he didn't see it that way. When he realised who it was that had done this, he was in a raging temper and he threw those tied shoes at me in anger. They hit me and gave me a black eye. Then he came at me. As he came to hit me, I was quick enough to take a defensive position and I hit him right on the jaw 
and that knocked him to the ground. After that he kept out of my way and the screws could see my black eye but they just ignored it. I think they must have known how to deal with bullies. The Electrical Installation Course Whilst at Dover I went on a six month training course doing electrical installations and I worked really hard obtaining top marks every week and used to get rewarded by a half ounce of tobacco for coming top of the class. I traded this with another inmate for his ration of milk each morning and cornflakes at the weekend and the egg on Sunday morning. We had to attend church on a Sunday where we would march to church in whatever weather. We would have to be dressed in our best gear after Sunday morning inspection. I remember I had no sense of respect for God or anything like that. In fact, when the vicar, Reverend Wally, took us for talks before we were to leave Borsal, I can remember ridiculing him in front of all the inmates, and I thought it was a huge joke. Paternity suit. While serving time at Borstal, I was served with a summoned to appear in court to answer a paternity suit. A former girlfriend was pregnant and had a child, and I presume the social services had made her declare who the father of the child was in order to get finance, but I am not sure, as I never spoke to her about it. In fact, I do not remember knowing anything about it until I had to appear in court. The first time in court I admitted I was the father because, because I could have been, even though I knew she'd been with other men. At the time, I was ordered to pay maintenance out of my three shillings and sixpence a week at a rate of one shilling and three pence per week. I had no idea of the seriousness of bringing up children or being a father or any idea of taking responsibility for my actions. My mother, however, was very anxious and after listening to the evidence given by the girl, she maintained it was not possible for me to be the father, as the timing of the events did not fit. She encouraged me to appeal, and she really fought the case for me. This I did with the aid of a solicitor. The girl had to prove I was the father of the child. I was the father of the child. When I look back, it must have been humiliating for the girl, because she had to explain when and where events took place. My defence solicitor asked where the event or events took place. With incredulity, he questioned her how could things happen and take place in a bubble car in the daytime. This, I think, on reflection, was humiliating for her. The suit was not proven and I was released from the charge. My probation officer, Mr Morling Hughes, asked many years later when I became a Christian and had to appear in court over my confessions to many crimes, asked, was I the father of the child? I replied, I might have been. The child was called David, and my mother says he had ginger hair. She had seen him out with his mother in Aylesbury whilst I was still in Borstal. He must be around 33 years old now. I met all kinds of lads here in Borstal, car thieves, burglars, forgers, gamblers. None of us had any idea or reason for our existence, but were probably looking looking for the best in life, but never finding it. When I was released, I was determined to have a good time. I wanted the best clothes, a good car, a speedboat, a caravan, you name it. I wanted all those things and intended to obtain them by one means or other. I had learned many criminal ways and had no intention of going straight. I just had no intention of getting caught at any crime I may choose to be involved in. I was released from Borstal a year later and it was during this time I began to get all the kinds of things through criminal activities in Aylesbury. I bought my first car for £100 when I came out of Borstal. It was a gold Mini 850cc.